You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. And um, he did the interview with me with a machete on his lap. And it was very, I could, Kevin did not feel terribly comfortable while shooting this. And I, well, part of the gift of, of Jerome Young is that he's very charming, but he never wants you to fully feel comfortable. That's part of the control and the power of what, what he wants out of those situations. <laughs> Hey everyone, thanks again for hitting that play button. It's another episode of the Dave Bullis Podcast. Uh, very quickly, before I get to the interview with John Filipavich, uh, I just want to say, I actually, I just created my first Zazzle store. Uh, so now, if you want to buy your first ever... Dave Bullis Podcast t-shirts. They are actually up. Uh, there's two designs. They are both up right now on Zazzle.com. And uh, both of these designs I will link to in the show notes. And again, this is just the an easier way for me to do this because without me having to, you know, buy shirts, worry about shipping them out to everybody who ordered one. With this website, you know, all you have to do is order it. They'll print it on demand. They send it to you. And then I'll get a you know, small percentage of that. So thank you again to everyone who supports the podcast, uh, whether you subscribe on iTunes or Podbean or whether you promote the show uh, you know, on, on Twitter or Facebook. I just want to say thanks again. And if there's anything else you want me to, uh, to do in terms of merchandise, please let me know. And I have a lot of very cool guests coming up. Uh, Halloween is right around the corner, so I have all horror-themed guests for Halloween. Um, I, I might do those as bonus episodes, though, because I just have so many people um, that want to be on the show, which is actually a good problem to have. But, um, again, thank you very much. And uh, if, if you want to contact me, it's you, all you have to do is go to my website, DaveBullis.com. There's a contact form right there. It's very easy to contact me. So, episode 74 with John Philip Pavich. John and I are going to talk about his documentary, which was called Barbed Wire City. I actually met John about two years ago when he actually was running his Kickstarter for this, uh, for Barbed Wire City. And I ended up donating. I ended up meeting him at the uh, the premiere, which was actually supposed to be the last night the ECW Arena was around. Well, here we are two years later. It's still around. Um, it you know ends up um, – it would have been a, a very good way to send off the arena, but the arena is still here now. So, you know, Barbed Wire City is all about – Extreme Championship Wrestling, uh, which was a promotion from the you know early 90s all the way until 2001. Uh, when I used to be involved in wrestling, I was a big wrestling fan. I uh, you know I actually uh, was a huge ECW fan. And uh, when it died in 2001, I was still in school and I uh, I was still in high school and I you know ended up just getting out of wrestling right after that. But um, you know I still remember a lot about it. And you know when when John talks about a lot of this stuff, I, I you know I remember watching it or seeing it on live on TV or pay per view. And you know it's it's funny just to hear some of the backstage stuff about a lot of this stuff. You know because he he ended up going and getting a lot of the old wrestlers. So if you're interested whether in that uh, you know side of it or whether you're interested about how he had to crowdfund this thing, about how the troubles he had of, of shooting a documentary, there's a little something for everybody. Uh, you know John and I ended up talking for almost three hours. I've trimmed this way down. So, um, you know, it's not going to be under three hours. Uh, so, again, uh, everyone, if you, you know, I, I really encourage you to just listen to this if you're thinking about starting a documentary or if you just want to hear about starting a successful Kickstarter. There's a lot of show notes in this one as well, including um, – uh, Jerry Michael Cohen's, who wrote a Kickstarter article about, you know, a guide all about funding your film. Uh, he was on the podcast a few episodes ago. He actually successfully crowdfunded his campaign, and uh, his article, uh, which he wrote on Jason Brubaker's site, is listed in the show notes. It's very cool. Uh, and, you know, again, I, I suggest you check that out. So, uh, without further ado, episode 74 with John Philip <laughs> Thanks again for joining me for another episode of the Dave Bulls Podcast. Joining me today is John Philip Pavage. John is the co-director and producer of Barbed Wire City, the unauthorized story of extreme championship wrestling. John, how are you? I am well. Thank you for having me, man. Oh, my pleasure. Because uh, the last time we saw each other was uh, at the premiere of Barbed Wire City. 
correct and, and, and full disclosure, because Dave's being awesome. I wasn't positive I had met Dave, and I probably had a, like a conversation with him. But as he noted to me, I was running around like completely overwhelmed trying to like help run that show. <laughs> so I thought that I uh, that I met Dave, but I did ask him off air if I met Dave. But yes, and that would be April of what 2013. We did that, so almost two and a half years now. Since yeah, I talk to you. Yeah, uh, I do remember that. Uh, I, and believe me, uh, John, I, I've been there, man. I know how it is. Uh, you know, you go into, you go into, you know, you're doing these events, and it's just like everything blurs together uh, of people and events and time and everything. It just sort of all go meshes together. Oh, and that, that that whole night was such. It was a culmination of like 13 years of work, and not not like I shouldn't even say it like that. It was, you know, got the idea in February of. 2000 started making notes. I was working with Kevin, the the other uh, co-director who worked with me on this project, and he's a childhood friend of mine. We were working together at a car wash. I started, I think I wrote four names down, and I said, hey, would you do this for me? And originally it was like, I wanted to write a book because I was a writer. Um, And we did, you know, quote, unquote, it was videography. We were like, you know, even in 2000, I would have been, I would have just turned, what, 19? That month, actually. I was 19 when I had the idea, I wrote four names down. I don't even know that we interviewed any of those four people, actually. Um, I think one. I think one, actually. Um, and yes, this was 13 years later. 13 years and one month later, or two months later, we, we finish it. And, and like everybody that I ever know was there. Plus all these amazing people I met through the uh, raising funds through Kickstarter, including yourself. Um, and then I had to like, you know, it was so DIY, I had to like help run the thing. I was telling you off air that I, uh, I said to somebody like, okay, we have to do the Q and A. So I need to find these people and like, let them in. I told them to come to this door and like, who's getting the cheese sticks? And one of the other people said, well, I have to do this. And the other person said, well, I've got to do this tech thing. And so I had to run down to Tony Luke's and get the cheese sticks that we had promised the people for to do a Q and A with me. So I didn't get to have an ego moment and feel like a star. <laughs> I had to go get cheese sticks and give them to people and uh, answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it was, it was no, the, the point is it was like an amazing night that I never thought that we would get to that point. And that was a big deal. And like, you always want to do more stuff, but it is one of those things where you go, like, if I could just do this one thing for the, in public, I'm not for the public. Cause really, I mean, let's be honest, you're doing a lot of it for yourself. You have an urge within yourself that you have to do, but it's amazing to get not just the validation, it's the buy-in from people. So, so just meeting all these people that inter- like yourself that had interacted with online, who showed up for it and they seemed like almost like they knew me and they were proud of me because <laughs> they had interacted with me so much over these months that that was like this really cool feeling, you know, to do, to do that. But yeah, it's that whole night is like both, I have memories of it and it's also this blur. I, I, well, I just remember downloading somebody's, I think it was the torches, uh, pro wrestling torch, which is for those of you who listen to this, who don't know wrestling, that is one of the, the major publications going back to the late eighties for wrestling, they did both, both men, Wade Keller and Bruce Mitchell appeared in the film and they did like a two hour and 15 minute, uh, like a review of the film and kind of a talk about history and different things. And I dropped my friend Gene off around, I think two forty five in the morning. And I drove back to the Lehigh Valley listening to that. And that for some reason, that memory of just being by myself and being like satisfied that I had completed something is something that like, it's that solitary thing that sticks with you. You know? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, John, I heard a story um, that on the set of Quentin Tarantino's last film, he had to get cheesesteaks for for everybody. So don't feel bad. <laughs> oh, I'd like to have his career. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, Jenna, I, I always usually start off with the same question for everybody. And um, that question is, could you just give us a little more about your background and, you know, how you got started in, in the uh, doing film? Sure. Um, I, let's see. I was born in 81 and I ended up very quickly living in Allentown, Pennsylvania, which for you wrestling fans who are also history geeks, I grew up like three blocks from Ag Hall, which is where WWF, which is now WWE, used to take their television. In fact, my first wrestling show ever was in, I think, 1990, like September of 90 at Ag Hall. Um, 
And the reason that I'm, I'm going on about this is because through an alleyway, which it was like half a block away, but there was an alleyway that kind of ended right near my row home yard. Um, through that alleyway, if you went directly from my yard through that path, was a house that we nicknamed the Karen Mansion. And that's because when I was two, my mom took me on a walk. And when you're two, like you can't go very far. So we went around the block and there was a little boy playing in a plastic swimming pool that was blue and it had alligators on it. And I thought that was the coolest. And I said, Mom, I want to play with that kid. But I was like really timid. So I probably hid behind her. And uh, luckily, Jolene, Kevin's mom, was outside, and my mom talked to her, and I ended up meeting this gentleman, Kevin Kiernan, when I was two. And that's been my creative partner ever since. And uh, so, wow, it's, we just passed July. I met him in July when we were two. I'm 34 now. 32 years that we've been uh, attached to each other in one way or the other. <laughs> So, um, yeah, we got in there, but we were doing creative projects when we were kids. We used to make movies with, um, with those over the shoulder VHS cameras. Um, <laughs> I remember Kev's, those. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kevin's dad, ball. Well, Kevin's dad, Charlie, I, he's like, um, I'm actually sitting in, in their property right now. Um, he's like a second father to me. They, they not only helped kind of raise me, but they still, they still kind of take care of me even now and look out for me. Um, when we do holidays, a lot of times I go to their house. I at least spend two hours with them pretty much every holiday, regardless of whether Kev or his sister Emily are in town. Um, our studio, like I said, is on, on their property. Um, and I don't mean to make it like they're rich, by the way. When people hear me say this, they always think that Kev's family has a ton of money. They bought, when, when we were six, they bought this dilapidated old, like, farmhouse property. Like, it was just a mess. And uh, there was, like, this building that, like, in real people's terms would have been condemned. It just wasn't, like, a public, public building. There was a spring house, because there used to be a natural spring on the bottom. And um, I remember being told very specifically, you were not allowed to go in there. Because if you open the door at the top, it, there was nothing there. But there was no floor. Um, and I remember being 16 and Kev took me out there and I didn't know, I hadn't really been spending time around his house. So I didn't know. And I remember even at 16, you know, you're near adulthood. I remember saying to him like, like, I'm like, yeah, we're not supposed to be going here. Like it was weird to me that he was taking me there cause he's not a mischievous guy. And, um, he opened the door and like his dad had completely refurbished it. His dad's like a DIY handyman who like always has side projects for weekends and stuff. And he completely changed it into this like cool, like it reminds me of like Lord of the Rings. Like, like the kind of, the kind of place that you, you, like the secret world you fall into. And, uh, it was like the place where he, he'd go to write children's stories and smoke his pipe because he used to smoke a pipe at the time. And, uh, we took that shit over right away, Dave. <laughs> they has been ours since we were 16. You know, we're going on almost 20 years and I am sitting in it right now and I love this place. <laughs> so this is where we were, we started making, uh, tape to tape VHS VHS editing on VCRs. You remember that stuff? Oh yeah. We do that. Uh, we made a comic book when we were uh, 94-ish, 1994, 93. We were really into making comic books. And I, uh, I tricked one of my uncles into getting us like a, a computer program, which seemed amazing at the time. I'm sure now if you looked at it, it would look like like MS. This is the first version of MS Paint, you know? So we had a comic book. We used to make uh, videos with the, the whole family. We They let us write it and kind of direct it. And then they would just kind of push us and nudge us in directions. And, um, and then we started just making like silly short films. And uh, I convinced Kev to do the, the Barbara City Project just because I had a fascination with the ECW arena and wrestling in general. And now this poor guy who has never, ever you know, pay, paid for a ticket for wrestling and never, and I was forced to watch it when he was a teenager knows far more about wrestling than the average, you know, the rank and file wrestling fan who isn't an obsessive fan. So I'm uh, I guess I'm sorry for that, but at the same time, it's fun because now I can do wrestling jokes with him and he gets it. So, <laughs> So, but basically, you know, I, I can imagine when you actually sat down, you know, uh, w with Kevin and actually like put on wrestling for the first time, I could imagine his response probably would have been something like, what the hell are we watching? 
he he would always he was never kind of sending about it. He would put his foot down here and there. Like I remember there was like a WCW pay per view in the early nineties. It was one of the ones where they were working with New Japan. Um, so it was like from the Tokyo Dome, and like anything that was from a foreign culture was fascinating to me as a kid. Like I just thought foreign cultures were so interesting because they weren't my daily life, and. I remember I got him like watching stuff on Saturday mornings when I'd sleep over and then we'd wake up early and like, he wouldn't tell me like turn that crap off or this or that. And he'd make comments about stuff. So like I was always trying to manipulating him into being a fan. So I had a friend because I didn't have a wrestling friend for years. And it was, and, you know, it was like, especially by the early nineties, it was like, it was uncool again. It was like, you just, you were a loser if you watched it. And I kept watching. So I had to keep it quiet, Dave. I couldn't tell people. But Kevin already knew, so I was always trying to manipulate him. Into, so, I, so I tried to get him to, like, buy the pay-per-view. And that's when he was just like, I, I'm not a fan of this. And no. I'm like, you know, I'll sit in a room if you watch it. I'll be nice to know. And then slowly but surely, I got him to, uh, to do this project. <laughs> and over the expanse of 13 years off and on, you know, now... I get a kick out of the fact that like he's uh, he's friendly with uh, Mike Johnson, the the wrestling reporter. So like he'll uh, Kevin has this gimmick where he texts me um, random things where his he pretends his blog is called The Outsider and the gimmick is that it's a person who doesn't really understand wrestling and isn't a fan but reports on it. <laughs> so anything that Mike puts on his feed, he just like makes a joke of it and texts it to me. So hopefully Mike doesn't listen to this or, or, or Kevin will be in trouble. <laughs> well, you know, you know, it's funny. You mentioned that there's that thing, uh, kfabenews.com that uh, <laughs> I always, the first time I ever saw it, I was like, what the hell is this? I, have you seen that? Do you know who showed that to me? <laughs> who, <who's> Kevin. <laughs> yeah. He, that, I see that's pretty much kind of where he got the gimmick. Although like, I believe his idea like, I'm sure it existed, but Kevin wouldn't know. He doesn't spend his free time usually. Like, I think one of the people he said yes to on Facebook when we... He had a lot of people trying to Facebook friend him during the film because I was everywhere and I was saying his name everywhere <laughs> because I did do all the media. He would he did, I think, two interviews, and I think they were both with Mike Johnson because we're friendly with Mike um, through, through making the film. We became friendly with Mike. And um, so Mike would kind of press him into it. And they were both, um, like, in person. Because he would just bail on it if it was on the phone. But, like, Mike was there and had his, like, iPad and was like, can I do this? Um, but, yeah, he... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting all sorry about this. Um, yeah, I only know about it because I guess he saw it because one of the fans he said yes to on Facebook was posting stuff. And he kind of went down the rabbit hole one day. And when we got to the studio to work on on something else, like this is after Barbara City, he um he showed this to me and he and I was just like, Is that where you got that idea or something? And he's like, No, but it's the same thing. I think I'm just gonna steal their ideas, like just joking. <laughs> so but yes, I'm aware of it because because he's the one who showed it to me, oddly enough. Yeah, I, I you know who showed up to me was the blue meanie. And uh, I, saw I love him. Brian. <laughs> yeah, I, he, he is the best man in the world. And I'm sorry, like I always call him Brian, and I'm not sure. I, I know in wrestling, there's like a. It's it's weird because like it's, Brian's a personal friend of mine, and I'm not gonna call him by by a, you know no offense to him, I'm not gonna call him by like a pretend name because he's my friend. Like I've been to his house, you know what I mean. <laughs> Um, we've gone on like road trips together, you know, for conventions and stuff. But, you, you, but like, he's the best man in the world. I'm sorry, I just had to say that. You you don't call him like, hey, Mr. Meanie, uh, like like you know you don't say, hey, uh, Mr. Meanie, or should I call you Blue? I well, I don't. <laughs> I, I don't remember my first. I'm sure my first conversation with him, like I would call him whatever he wanted, and then at some point I just had a conversation. With him. I think he introduced himself as like Brian. Like I think. I did somewhere in there, like post interviewing him when he reached out to me when we started the Kickstarter thing, um, we just had a conversation about it. And I would call him by and he never like said anything about it. And finally, just because I'm me and I'm super detail oriented and I want people to be comfortable with everything, I said to him like, "Is that you know, is that okay?" Like I, I just feel weird calling a like a an actual friend of mine by this by this name. But if you think it's like disrespectful because within your industry, you know, it's kind of like this thing where some guys you might be really good friends with a guy who is a heel in a company. 
And if you're, if you're, if he gets your comp tickets to sit in the front row, he kind of expects you to boo him. You know, in fact, he wants you to really give it to him because that's his job, you know? So if he asked me to do something like that, I would, but uh, you know, fortunately I, I became friends with the guy who's like never going to be a heel in any room he ever steps into. So I don't have to worry about things like that. Yeah, um, I, you know, just as a little side story, uh, one time when I when I was helping uh, King Kong Bundy, uh, and uh, a friend of mine was training under him at, at when he when he was in wrestling school, and I would come and I'd help set up like the chairs and stuff like that, and then I then it, I, he was like, hey, we can help set up the ring, and I was like, sure, you know, I, I'll help out. It was for free, whatever. So finally, uh, they came to me one day and they said, we want you to, went into an angle where. Um, uh, this, this, like this heel, uh, attacks a fan. So my, so this is what my friend was going to be a fan next to me. Right. So here's the thing. Okay. So we're sitting next to each other, my friend and myself, and one of their heels is coming out and he says that, and, and he cheats to win. Right. Sure. So, so my friend, like we, now he, now he has all his friends and family there and he didn't tell anybody about this except for me. Now I was the only one in on this. So he gets up and he yells, that's bullshit. You're a cheating motherfucker. Pierce says blah, blah, blah. So he ends up getting into a brawl with his heel. And the, I turn and his fiance and everything are looking at him like, what the fuck is going on here? And it was just, I couldn't stop fucking laughing. And uh, they ended up, you know, scuffling in the ring and security broke it up, this and that. But uh, it was just, it was hilarious. I, 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 <laughs> I don't know. What, I'm sorry, that, that story didn't really have much to do with what we were talking about, but I thought I'd be here. By the way, this is primarily a, a, a filmmaking uh, podcast, right? Yes. <laughs> so this, this is, does most of your listenership have no idea what we're talking about right now? Oh, oh they probably tuned out already. They probably heard, heard me talk about, you know, uh, wrestling by now. And they're like, oh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll come back next week, Dave. Uh, but, but no, yeah, glad, <laughs> but this is... Glad I'm such a channel changer. <laughs> <laughs> well, those, uh, that's, that's great. those are circumstances. What are you going to do? No, they, they're going to hear me talking about King Kong Bundy. I mean, like, oh, well, he did work Richard Pryor at one point, so maybe Dave has a point here. Um, but, you know, no, this, is, this is film-centric, you know. Uh, but, I mean, we're, you know, we're talking about the documentary, and, you know, uh, it just happens to be about wrestling. So uh, I just want to share that story, you know. Uh, personally, I think a lot of viewers will love this because I actually have requests to do more things about documentaries. So, uh, cool. so, uh, so I know, That's I, in my bag, man. Yeah, so I know people will, will, will definitely be interested in this and you know uh so i wanted to ask you is you know as we talk about your documentary barbed wire city you know how did you go about finally starting to put this all together uh you know in those initial stages meaning like you know how did you get started putting together like okay i have a list of people i want to talk to did you know how did you start going about you know reaching out to these people okay let's see here uh, I am not good with brevity. So I'm going to try to condense this because it is a 13 year story. Um, <laughs> oh, luckily, at least I can sort of uh, spin a tail. Um, at first, like I said, um, I think I said this on the podcast and not when we were talking beforehand. Um, I had a list of like four people. Like I wanted to write a book about my, like a, almost like a, a Hunter S. Thompson esque, like fan journal going to the arena and why it was important to people. Like it was a cultural thing. And I've always been fascinated with sociology. And I was one of those people when I was finally old enough to, when I got my license, um, I would go to the, in fact, the first two times I went to the arena, like my aunt drove me there with like two or three friends. Um, I just wanted to go so badly. I didn't get, I was one of those people who didn't get their license right away. I don't know. It's weird now for me to like think back why. I just think it was just, I just probably figured, ah, my parents, they're they're not going to like let me drive a car and I don't have money. So like, why bother? So it wasn't until I was 18 that I could drive myself down. And um, regardless, we would just stand in line outside and like I know it's a status thing to sit ringside and you don't have to show up until five minutes before the show and you know this guy and like John Bailey the, the straw hat guy takes tickets so you go in the side door and give him a hug and all that stuff and that's all well and cool and I'm sure if I had that option back then I would have taken it I eventually ended up taking that option actually now that I think of it um, but at the time I thought it was really neat to Get in a car at 10 in the morning, take the long way, so to speak, 
get down there around, you know, 1130 noon and be part of this kind of like carnival outside, especially in the later days. By the time I started driving down with friends in um, later 99 is when I, I actually started driving down. People were already lined up. Like I, like we would show up the one time I think we got there by like 1130. We were nowhere near the first people in line um, outside of the arena. We were probably the 30th people in line, frankly. Um, and I saw some crazy things in that line. You know, I think maybe only one or two things. The very final ECW arena show, I actually stood in line by myself and I had a camera and I shot footage and I think maybe a total of 10 seconds made it into the film proper when we released it. Um, and, I, and one of the scenes is actually like what I'm thinking of, which is that like people in line set fire to a bunch of like cardboard and discarded um, wood. Because in that area, like, there's kind of this mythology about that area. It's really not a rough area. Like if you go a block, like it's, it literally is under I-95. And it's in kind of like this industrial kind of dead end, um, which is kind of commercial, low rent commercial space and industrial park-ish stuff for a block or two. But if you go to the other side of 95, those are old ethnic neighborhoods. And I spent a lot of time in that area walking around shooting footage um, in 2000, 2001, 2006, and then in the, the year before the film. Um, they have like carnivals in the summer. They're, they're the kind of neighborhoods that still like get permits to close off uh, roads and like rent those moon bounces and like have vendors. Like it's, it's one of those neighborhoods where everybody kind of knows everybody and they all know a guy who does something. So you can get these kind of things probably for free. And it's not rough. Like I would, I, I have a nephew that's nine. I'd take him and walk around that neighborhood, you know, but on show nights, I wouldn't have taken, him to, I wouldn't have taken him to Swanson and Rittner street. I'll tell you that, you know, the, the, uh, the memory I was thinking of was these dudes like set stuff on fire and then were chanting stuff. And I think partially that made it into the film. There was another where some underage kid was drinking like a handle of hard liquor all day and then was out of his head and like slumped down against the post and people were voyeuristically watching him. And then he threw up on himself and just sat there and people were chanting things and it was both entertaining and bizarre. And now that I'm older, kind of disgusting of people, but still something that probably should be kind of documented. There's a, there's a good side and a bad side to all those things. And I think we definitely kind of touched on that in the film. If anything, my sadness is in not being able to break it through to more, to more non-wrestling fans because there's such a, um, like you even joked about, like there are people who probably turned off the podcast because they're like, oh, they're talking about wrestling and this guy did a wrestling thing. You probably, yeah, there's still this meme that uh, like Dana White brought it up this week. You know, he, um, people who watch wrestling must not know it's quote unquote fake, which is a horrible word for it. It's kind of offensive, I think. And I think that's where the emotional knee jerk reaction comes. I just don't think fans articulate it well because they get emotional. <laughs> But it's this idea that you must be so dumb and low rent that you, you know, it's 1930 and you've been conned by the carnival that comes through during the summer. And that's not really it, you know. But unfortunately, it has a bad name. So we weren't able, except on very, in very small moral victories, to break it through to people who just were fascinated by sociological events and niche culture that's in my opinion misunderstood and that's really what the film was about you know i had some very combative interviews i think when i uh when i promoted this the second time around the first time around was kickstarter to raise money and you had to go uh, the wrestling circuit is where i kind of had to go you know so you try to intellectualize and talk about whatever, but you also have to be like, yeah, all your favorites will be here and all this stuff. And you're not lying. It's just, you're playing to your audience. And I think by the time it came out and I would read reviews, we got a lot of positive reviews, but all the, the knocks would be like really fan to me, fanboyish wrestling centric, um, 
uh, critiques, for, uh, which I think is a generous word considering what these people express themselves. But um, it, it, that made me sad because I realized that the film was being completely viewed, or 90 to 95 percent being viewed through the prism of pro wrestling and pro wrestling releases. And I think there was a massive difference between what we did and say what WWE would put out and call a quote unquote documentary or what, you know, even like high spots or RF video. You know, I'd get messages like, how come this is like this? Cause RF video did this. And I'm thinking like, no offense to Rob, because obviously we licensed footage from him. And like, I have a fine relationship with Rob Feinstein, who is the owner and operator of RF video, but like that, he's a rest, he's a guy who does wrestling tapes, you know? <laughs> And I don't, I don't mean to say that derisively, but in comparison, when you're comparing like a documentary to like shoot interviews, that was really my beef, you know? Sorry, I'm jumping so far ahead in like your questions, most likely. No, no, but, no. Um, yeah, that's something that was like, so, so these interviews like became sort of combative for me. Like it became kind of like this intellectual battle to to make my point without being like a condescending dick to people because I just, I didn't have any more patience for like uh, one interview was like the question wasn't, I would get these questions that weren't questions from these wrestling podcasts that were like the Dudley is in, in ECW and now they've already seen my film. So they've seen us sort of take to task the idea that Paul Heyman allowed things to get out of control and, you know, the Dudleys would just go out there and bake fans and it would result sometimes in, you know, at the low level, it would result in like, yes, a lot of heat, but a lot of it was just creating an atmosphere that was kind of uncomfortable and unsafe for anybody who wasn't like a male in their early 20s who wanted to get drunk and like get crazy. And at its worst, it was like physical violence, you know. But the question would be like, uh, Dudley's in ECW was pretty crazy, right? Where do you think it was crazier? Was it Dudley's crazier and sillier in like the Elks Lodge? And um, so the whole premise of the question, it's not even like a really a question. It's more like, tell me how awesome it was that these guys did this. And I don't know that it was awesome. That's the thing, you know, like I don't, I think it was, you know, not even specifically the Dudley's, but the things that they were doing, I didn't think were necessarily good for them. I think it built on the cultishness, it built on the mythology, but I don't think that it helped them, well, obviously it didn't help them in the long run, you know. And I don't think it would be done, it well, certainly wouldn't be done today because of the standards of the way people view things. But also I don't think Paul Heyman would do it even if those standards didn't exist. I think he would have realized and put the brakes on. One thing I do believe when Paul Heyman has done interviews and, you know, for some reason, Steve Austin like really liked our film. Um, and anybody who sort of even passively related to ECW, he asks about. And I almost drove off the road the one morning when I downloaded the podcast to listen to him talk to Heyman. Because Heyman is, to this day, one of the most fascinating people that, that I would ever research or would ever cover in any way. I think that I'll be 80 and I'll still, he'll still be top three at worst. And uh, Austin brought up Barbara City to him and he said that he had never seen it, which may or may not be true, but that's kind of irrelevant to me. What's more relevant is that he said, you know, people always talk about the Heyman Kool-Aid and all this. He's like, nobody drank the Kool-Aid more than me. And, you know, we kept amping up things because part of the question to Austin's credit was about like, you know, the violence, the, the way we covered the violence. And if he thought looking back, it was necessary to go over the top, you know, did it hurt things in the long run? And his answer I thought was actually like, really honest for him. Not that he's a liar, but I think he knows how to speak to an audience. You know what I mean? I think there's portions of truth and there's portions of, of manipulation in anything he says, but he did say like, you know, everybody blames me, but I was the one drinking. Like, it's my money. I was throwing all this money at this thing. And uh, I believe him. You know, I believe, and I've talked to a lot of people that are, you know, that have been close to him or are still closer than and ECW would have become very similar to early ROH. 
um, had it existed. You know, it wouldn't have been a carbon copy of it, but that's the way he saw the landscape going. And it also would have had a much bigger mixed martial arts um, tinge to it. He saw that coming. I mean, I still see that guy as a visionary. If I had um, millions and millions of dollars and I wanted to do something in the uh, pro wrestling genre or, or, you know, or some version of that, I, I would be throwing money at Paul Heyman to join me. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, when East W was in its death throes, I remember um, he was talking about bringing in guys like Spanky, uh, Brian, who was Brian Kendrick, guys like CM Punk. Uh, he actually had an Loki. eye. Yeah, Loki. He had. He actually was talking about these guys before anybody had a clue who the hell these guys were. Um, and, and this isn't just him saying this because they all brought this up too. That they were like, "Hey, you know, Paul Heyman." Um, one guy who I know. Again, I'm sorry, going a little off topic here. Um, one guy who I always wondered why he wasn't ECW was Madman Pondo. Um, but that's a whole, you know, that I, that's always something I'm always like, you know, I, I don't get why he, cause he was wrestling in the nineties. Uh, um, oh, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and you know, uh, a couple of, I've always wondered, you know, why he didn't go to ECW. Um, so even for just for a tryout match. Um, but any, but you know, but, um, you know, it, with the way the Zeitgeist did change, you know, I, I know, you know, in Japan, they have a league that is similar to that. I think it's Pancreas. Uh, no, it's not Pancreas, is it? Uh, what, no. it it's because they do because they do like K1 fights and they do some of like mixed martial arts and they also have pro wrestling bouts. And I can't remember the name of the of the company right now off the top of my head. Do you, do you know who it is? I, I know that those existed. Well, P- Pancreas was the arguably the first uh, pure MMA. Yeah, that's, um, I, I, yeah. As soon as I said, I know I was wrong. I'm wrong a lot yeah. on this podcast, by the way, John. Just so you know. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> my, my, audience knows, answer, I'll tell you. my audience knows not to believe a word I say about <laughs> anything. Well, they basically, like, there's, there, there were several promotions, and I don't even know that they really exist in the form you're talking about now, but there, there were a bunch. Like, uh, the MMA and pro wrestling in Japan, even, uh, like, even in the 70s, before MMA, like, really, truly existed, like, Antonio Inoki used to, fight, he used to always bring in people and then smarten them up to quote unquote the business. Like Muhammad Ali is the most famous example and he didn't actually want to lose to Inoki, which is why they ended up having this horrible uh, fight in Tokyo in 76. But like that whole mixed martial arts thing was a gimmick that Inoki did because he had been to Brazil and trained jujitsu. Um, but his goal was to make it so that pro wrestling was a fighting discipline, almost as like, um, work. And, okay, I'm trying to, I should speak for the rest of the audience. Um, he wanted it to be part of storyline, is, is the simplest way to put it. Was it. The idea that pro wrestling itself was a fighting discipline in the way we think of karate or jiu-jitsu or something like that. And he would bring these guys in and pay them a lot of money to lose to him these authentic people within their discipline to further the idea with his fan base that pro wrestling was a better fighting art. And that's really how UFC started anyway. It was like the boxer versus the wrestler, or, you know, this guy, you know, this guy does this versus the Taekwondo guy. So, yeah, I mean, that's always been intertwined in Japan. You know, that's why pride was, people uh, look at pride, which is an MMA organization that was huge in Japan and, they romanticize it, but like if you go back, it's like a lot of pro wrestling stuff. There were pro wrestlers fighting MMA fights. Um, some of the finishes were like somewhat manipulated, you know. So yeah, that's that's existed. Yeah, and it's you know just as a uh, a side note, you know guys like uh, Sakuraba, you know his whole style when he fought in Pride was pro, uh, prof- uh, Japanese professional wrestling. Like when everyone had their you know they would say like their name, their weight, age, their weight, and the style. His style was Japanese professional wrestling, um, and, and that's and that's when he was the Gracie Hunter. Yeah, I mean, and there's a guy who comes from UWFI. Like, there were all these like splinter groups that splintered off of. Here's a little geek history for you, you and your your listeners. In the '80s, there were all these like groups of people who trained in the uh, New Japan Dojo, who then would be lower card guys, and then they'd split. A group of them would splinter off, and they started like the UWF. Then there was a second UWF, and then there was the UWFI, which is uh, something Universal Wrestling, blah blah blah, international. And um, they were like early stages of, of work shoots. 
some of the fights would kind of be like real fight-ish things where they knew the finish, but they didn't care how they got there. Um, and some of it was just a mimic. And the idea was like, we're realer than pro wrestling. Like those guys are phony, but we're real kind of a thing. And that's where Sakuraba came from. And he would bounce in and out of New Japan. And then he decided to be a straight up shoot fighter. And, you know, pride took him out. I mean, look at the, the first pride. Pride only existed because um, I think it was, how do you say his last name? Tanaka or something. Um, there's a wrestler, uh, Nokio. I'm, I'm butchering it. You know, I'm, there's somebody yelling at their iPod right now. Um, <laughs> there's a gentleman who was, who was in the UWFI and, and, um, and uh, was their champion. And then he had some big fights with, uh, when they were falling apart, he had title matches with the great Muda. Uh, at the Tokyo Dome, and then another one, with, at least one more, with Hashimoto, uh, who was another uh, New Japan star in the 90s. And then his, and then the first pride was him, and he was essentially just a pro wrestler who pretended to be a shooter. You know, and he had he had rudimentary skills for the time, sure, but he wasn't like you know Sakuraba. And um, the first pride was him versus uh, one of the Gracies, who trounced him, by the way. <laughs> And the big comeback was Sakuraba. You know, he was a great honor. He was defending the honor of pro wrestling. That was the quote unquote storyline of this legitimate shoot promotion. You know, so they they would blur lines too, even though they were they were a shoot promotion in the way that pro wrestling would blur lines and work fights. Yeah, um, I, I know who you're talking about. It's uh, I think it's pronounced uh, no, Nobukido. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Takata, but it's like, first name's like Nobukido. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Takata. Um, you know, and uh, I know. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. But uh, but yeah, uh, and you know, that's when you know all those promotions started. And I remember, you know, a lot of guys just started coming up at it. Uh, you know, through the ranks of of Pride too, and. Um, you know, uh, that's we really. I, to me, that was the last time where you really saw somebody like the fighters who really knew what they were doing. Um, and and what I, here's what I mean by that: they they all had one style, meaning like Sakuraba had jab professional wrestling. Mirko Krokop was a kickboxer. Um, you know, Igor Vovchanchin. You know, he just did heavy boxing stuff like that. Um, right. They didn't. You didn't see like the UFC now. Everyone sort of high, has a hybrid style where everyone does. You know, day one is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. To the next day, some Muay Thai. Um, you sort of get a jack of all trades and a master of nothing training like that. Um, mm. While in Pride, I mean, uh, you really could just tell just by the way the guy worked, that uh, the way the guy fought, the way he moved. You know, whether he was like a, a Gracie guy uh, or if he was a stand-up fighter. I mean, it just um, I really wish it would go back to that um, in a lot of ways. And, and, and you know, watching some of the Japanese fights now, uh, there it still is that way because. Um, there's Dream right now, uh, and there's mm. a guy that I you know absolutely love to watch, and that is, um, of course, I'm gonna, I just blanked out on his name. Um, that is, um, well, I forgot his name, but I, <laughs> I'll post it, I, I will post it in the show notes. I promise, uh, unless I can remember it quickly, um, but I don't think I can. So. Um, but you know, back to you know your your uh, you know everything with you know you and in Barbed Wire City, you know this documentary was about the subculture of, of ECW and and all the crazy things and, and professional wrestling and people call it fake, but you know the injuries are all real and you know you've got guys being paralyzed, and you've got the some people you know uh, bleeding and and uh, they need, require you know real stitches. And- well, it's just an irrelevant argument to me because it's it's like. <laughs> It's like if I really liked the show Sopranos and you kept telling me and I would get like really into the, the storyline and we were having a discussion and you're like, you know, you know, it's fake job. You know, they're not really mobsters. They're like fake. Um, I'd be like, yeah, I know they're actors. I'm really into the the show, the presentation. It's the way it's world building. They built, they built a world correctly. The narrative is good. And like that, I mean, yeah, I, I, you're doing a good job. You, you're giving the answer that a lot of like intelligent people give, but I even think that is almost too much of humoring these people who say these kind of things because what they're inferring is that you're what what they would call in wrestling a mark, which is kind of an offensive term for wrestling fans. It's like the N word in some weird way. Certainly not to that degree, but its its derivative is from the carnivals, where and I've heard different stories about like 
like uh, of like kind of the mythologizing of the term. I think Dutch Mantel in the late '90s used to do a blog I read where he said um, he had always been told that when a carnival would come into town, they'd have a guy who went around and acted as though he uh, he was like poor and homeless and needed food. And if you know somebody was nice enough to give him food, he would mark. Uh, with like chalk or something, he marking uh, a very subtle X in front of the gate to the house or the the front walk. And what that meant was not that they were a mark, but that's what the term became. But it meant these people are willing; they, they'll they'll kind of fall for your story, kind of a thing. So you can go house to house and get food or something like that. You know, there was some sort of like uh, manipulation there within that I'm that I'm kind of forgetting about. But um, that's one of the old wives' tales that is probably not true, but is a great story. The point being is that m- Mark is this negative term meaning that you're a fool. That is where it came from. When, you're, when, you, when wrestling people call, and it's not nearly as prevalent because it's completely different. It's an entertainment industry now. But even even in the late 90s when ECW, um, ECW was like the last territory, you know, because wrestling used to be in a territory system and it wasn't a national thing. And um, there was some old school things, as they say, in wrestling to it. And like calling somebody a mark is really like saying that they're a dumb person who believes that you're, you know, you, that you're balls Mahoney and you hit people with chairs in your daily life and you're not John Reckner and you don't have like a day job or something, you know, or a kid or a wife, you know. This mythological sea monster who only comes out every third Saturday to the ECW arena and tries to kill somebody for real. And I believe you, that kind of thing. <laughs> You're telling me Boss Mahoney does not actually walk around blowing fire and hitting people with chairs? Well, now, Boss Mahoney might. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's another story entirely. Yeah, like the the one guy who I actually could seriously see living his gimmick twenty four seven is New Jack. Um, I think there's some validity to that in a sense. <laughs> he's crazy, but he's crazy like a fox. I was very impressed by him. He did his interview with me. And I've told this story before, but you have a very different audience, and it's been at least two years. I was very nervous about interviewing Jack, and originally we were going to get him. Um, when we shot all the footage at the extreme reunion, which was in a, a reunion of a lot of the ECW guys and they were going to do a show. Um, what was it? At that, the point that they did the show, it was like 13 years or 12 years after it had shut down, something like that. And we had a room at the motel that they were all staying in and we were grabbing people and doing interviews in our um, motel room. Then across the hall, we kept hearing this person yelling, and it's funny, like um, Rob Feinstein, who I met, mentioned before, does this thing called shoot interviews, which is kind of a dying thing because it's podcast, because of what we're doing now. Um, back in the late 90s, he, he didn't create it, but he was one of the people who figured out how to monetize it, and it was before wrestling was very, very open as far as the gentleman wrestling, talking as themselves, the person and talking about their experiences. He, he would film that and he would put it out on VHS tapes. And uh, so he was actually doing one across the hall and the person yelling and carrying on was Jer- Jerome Young, AKA New Jack. And uh, we put in a call to somebody working with us who put in a call to Jack to get him you know, across the hall to sit with us for 30 minutes. And he wanted to know how much we paid. And now we didn't pay for a single interview. So at that time, he didn't want to do it. And then through some connections and some machinations, we ended up sitting down with him um, at one of these uh, extreme, whatever that promotion became, I, they, they changed their name. Extreme Rising, that was it. And um, he did the interview with me with a machete on his lap. And it was very, I could, Kevin did not feel terribly comfortable while shooting this. And I, part of the gift of of Jerome Young is that he's very charming, but he never wants you to fully feel comfortable. That's part of the control and the power of what, what he wants out of those situations. And so I 
pretty early on said, uh, I pointed to the machete on his lap and said, so is that, so is that for me? I, I forget exactly what I said. I'm sure I was nervous. I'm sure when I said it, but hopefully I pulled it off well enough. Basically like, hey, is that for me? If this goes bad and he just gave me the crazy eyes and then smiled. And, um, I actually put me at ease because it was one of those things where I was like, he knows what he's doing. You know what I mean? Like he's not, he's not here to mess with civilians, so to speak in quotes. Um, and we had the best interview. And in fact, like I think on the DVD, we actually put an extra like eight to four, it might have even been 14 minutes of like outtakes for stuff. He talked about so much stuff that had nothing to do with our narrative, but was so entertaining. And we put it on there. He is by far the person that non wrestling fans come to me and say, I found him so funny, so entertaining, so charming. And all these things are true. And then I would say, we finished. He signed the release with no trouble. And he made a joke going like, you were nervous until I signed this, you know, making it you know official that we could use it. We shook hands. We chatted. We were packing up. And then he literally assaulted a fellow wrestler in front of us. And it scared the shit out of me, man. It was because you just see that visceral, real violence in front of you. It's It's different. You know, I think at times we become desensitized, especially when we, we see it through a TV and things like that. You know, violence is an interesting thing to me because I, I love MMA. I used to work briefly for about a year, year and a half. I worked, you know, part-time for an MMA website in 07. And we used to go, we got press passes and I would, uh, I would be media at ringside and do live blogging and stuff like that. And it, it's kind of that same feeling. You watch MMA on TV and guys get knocked out and they're like, oh, wow, that was great. And then they're alive, like, you know, feeder, media row generally at these things is like what, 10 to 15 feet away. It sits right there at cage side. And you get like these like light heavyweights, heavyweights in the ring and they hit each other. Um, you feel the vibrations of them, they're, that kick, like out <laughs> 15 feet away. And you cringe. It's very visceral and real. And in that moment, you go like, oh, wow. Like, that hurts. That doesn't just hurt. That could kill somebody if done wrong. You know, like, that, it's something different. And that's kind of what I felt with Jack. Like, that's, <laughs> he's crazy like a fox is the best way to put it. He knows exactly what he's doing at all times. And the trick is to charm you, but also make you think that this guy might do something. You know? So wh- why did he assault another wrestler? <laughs> That's the whole story. <laughs> um, and you know what? I I don't even know that I can tell it. I'll, I'll give you like the, the cheap version because the truth is that it was very detailed and I used to be able to tell it. But this happened like three years ago and um, I don't remember exactly. Um, there was a problem. Okay, so the other, this isn't like non, it's not common knowledge, but it's not like a, I'm not telling secrets out of, out of school. Um there had been a problem between New Jack and Balls and Pony, who we had mentioned before, uh, at the first reunion show. And this was the second one now in like June, I think. And um, they had gone back and forth and there was all this stuff. And like, in fact, when I got to the building, I ran into somebody who was like, are you interviewing Jack today? And I said, yes. And they said, oh, you better watch out. He has a gang. Yeah. Like, he, no, oh, yeah. It was, uh, he said he's going to kill balls. And I kind of smirked and said, like, oh, yeah, but see, I think, I really think that Jack was working. And, and again, I'll have to explain this for people who don't understand. I think, <laughs> this is the weird thing about wrestling. Part of Jack's income over the last decade, because he pretty much can't get a job with, uh, with the wrestling industry shrinking, his style going out of vogue, so, and him just kind of being a nutty guy, um, it's hard for him to get work within wrestling. And part of his income was derived from doing shoot interviews, and he's smart, like I said. So Jack knows to do a shoot interview and to have people buy it and therefore make yourself a commodity that can demand, you know, two grand or four grand or whatever he was getting paid for, for just sitting down and telling stories for three hours for, on one day, you've got to have stories. So if you do a lot of shoot interviews, you run out of stories and people don't want to buy it anymore. And I think that Jack liked creating hysteria. 
so that he would be more marketable. That's part of that whole carny thing, that 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 that, that wrestler persona. And I really believe that Jack. I, I had a conversation with him earlier in that week, where it seemed we we were we met in person because he was in town in Philly. And um, it was for a bit. We both had to be somewhere for different reasons. And we ended up being around each other for about two hours and talking for about almost one of them, I would say. We, I did most of my talking with him. And my impression is that he knew that he didn't really have a problem with John Reckner, the person, or Balls Mahoney, the character, um, in real life. But he was creating one, and if he pushed hard enough, Balls would say something that would lead to there being more kind of hysteria around it. I, I, I really, this is how goofy wrestling is. I think that he was creating a situation, like in wrestling parlance, they would call it uh, uh, working an angle. But in real life, he was kind of creating this storyline in real life and not, and I don't think Balls Mahoney knew that he was part of a fake story. You know what I mean? So apparently, and I don't even think that this was true, but I was told, well, you know, Balls, is, Balls Mahoney is in the building already. I said, oh, okay. So this is really going to be a thing. He's like, oh yeah, Balls showed me he's got like a little gun or something in his bag. And I'm like, so I was on edge. You know what I mean? <laughs> And, uh, and then he walked up to him, and uh, Balls might have said, like, two words. Like, I said, like, Balls tried to talk to him. Like, and this wasn't, listen, other than myself and Kevin, there was nobody in this room that was a fan or something, you know. This, were, this is like Stevie Richards was in the room, John Finnegan. It was a, people I was friendly with, actually. You know, John Finnegan was an old referee for, for ECW, and he's worked a lot of other places. It, he wasn't trying to fool fans to make money in that way in that room. But he was for real. Like, I, it is so weird, the psychology of these, especially, I don't feel like the newer wrestlers, that, that that's a thing. They see it as entertainment. They all grew up on WWE. And um, they want to be good corporate citizens and ply their trade for the most part. Or do it for the art. You know what I mean? The journeymen who, who, who get a lot of buzz on the internet, they do it kind of for their art and because they love it. And in some cases, it's because they don't want to grow up. Because you get to be as angel uh, of, of the Baldies. From, East, from later to ECW said to me, he's like, it's like you're always in high school and every weekend is like a high school party. You know, you never have to leave. I think that all these factors go into this kind of thing. And then after a while, you don't know what else to do. This is, it's not a transferable skill, pretending artfully to beat somebody up. is isn't something that you can go across the street and say, hey, I would like to sell cars for you, or you know, I would like to sit in a cubicle and uh, do tech support for your tech company. So in this case, Jack created something, and I guess Ball kind of fell for it. And um, that's all he needed. And he just walked up to him and punched him in the face a million times. And to, to Balls Mahoney's credit, he never tried to strike Jack, which is, you know, somebody hit him in the face, you know. It's just, he just defended himself and covering up and kept trying to talk sense to him. You know what I mean? And uh, I will admit that I'm the person who finally said, you know, this is going on way too long. And I ran and got one of the promoters and I got Atlas Security. And uh, they ran in and grabbed him. Well, <laughs> that is a hell of a story. Uh, I could definitely, you know, I, I remember uh, seeing something about that a couple years ago uh, with Balls um, and, and uh, New Jack had a problem with one another. Um, Postscript, by the way, they did do um, a shoot interview with Rob Feinstein. Yes. Afterwards. And um, I've never seen the whole thing, but from what I saw, by that point, everybody was clued in, wink, wink. I mean, Rob, this, I, I don't know. I haven't talked to Rob in quite a while. But Rob swore to me even after it was shot, that, oh, it was real, and we got an off-duty police officer. And I was kind of shocked because he, either he was trying to, quote-unquote, work me, as they say in wrestling, which is like, uh, do, do the whole fake thing, do the lie thing. Or, or he just really believed it was real, and he pissed away money on, on an undercover cop to do, do security for them. You know? 
I, I, by that point, I don't think that, I think everybody knew what was going on sort of thing, but they made their money. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, you know the, that whole thing. You know, this whole story kind of reminds me of you know some of the obstacles you, you'll face when making a movie. Um, but these are some of the obstacles you face, you know, making this documentary. Was <laughs> you thought that some of your your, your um, the people you were interviewing were going, your, some of your subjects, you know, were going to assault you at any time, particularly New Jack. Yes, or lie to me. That was another thing. There's a lot of we had so many theoretical slash like I hate to use this word because it's it's used in a dirty way which kind of sucks but intellectual uh, debates and uh, what would what would you call it um, we would watch footage and there'd be three people saying three different things and we would have to talk about like and it's also dealing with wrestling you're dealing with something where people within that industry they interchange truth and the real world with what they call Working, which is like they have their own term for lying. It's called working. It's okay if you flat out lie to somebody, even like your wife or your best friend, if you're working. Now, if it was lying, yeah, that's horrible, you know. But if you work somebody, that's not okay. So we would have these debates where you'd sit at the editing bay, and two of us would just finally like kind of like sigh and look at each other, and the other would turn and say, like, "Do we know that so and so thinks this?" Or that he believes this, or do we know this to be true? Because now I'm the go-to wrestling guy. So I have to talk about the backstory of these things and like what I've learned through research. So a lot of this game was knowing all the, the stuff. You know, I did a lot. When we, when we decided to, to, to finally do this and finish it, I spent two months diving back into every piece of notes and every every uh like i mentioned the newsletters before i read every newsletter thing about ecw at that time i would call journalists and i'd have off the record chats about things and that gets murky too because the journalists aren't buddies and they have different masters they're serving within like any reporter has sources in that industry that they are trying to protect and that might be personal friends and they all have different perceptions about things and so it, it can be a mess to untangle, you know? <laughs> like, you have to worry about, um, there were a lot of times where I interviewed somebody and they'd say something and I'd either, uh, my first, you know, cynical thought was, well, they're lying to me. Well, this is great. And then, you know, I'd watch the tape again and I'd think, you know, I'd put all the pieces together and go, they probably think what they, they're saying is true now that I think of it. It's not. I know it's not, but they don't know. You know what I mean? Like, look in the movie. Balls Mahoney thought that ECW was being restructured. You know, I was, uh, I was barely 20 when I did that interview with him. And I had the legal documentation of the filing of Chapter 11. In, and I, it, you can see it in the film. We're talking about it. And he's like, oh, yeah, 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 Chapter 11, restructuring. Yeah. There's a lot that, that you don't know that I can't say. And uh, what are you supposed to say to that guy? Like, you know, <laughs> no offense, but I'm pretty, con- you know, even being 20, I was relatively well connected at the time. Obviously, I'm doing this project, you know? So I knew what the score was on that, but obviously his head had been filled by, you know, not only wanting to believe these things because who wants to lose their, what they consider their dream job, but he also probably had people telling him to just hold on, just hold on. You know, I got that a lot from people, even, well, you know, 12 years after the fact when interviewing people, you know, I have a whole role of people saying they just wanted to talking not only about wanting to believe, but talking about their emotions, either if they went to the last show in the middle of nowhere that they, that they did, or, Several months later, when Paul Heyman, the owner of ECW, walked on to uh, WWE's live uh, broadcast they do every Monday, which is raw. That was a big topic, topic with people, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, uh, again, you know, for for the, all the listeners out there, you know, what John is talking about is, is you know, for all, uh, anyone making a documentary, you know, he had to worry about you know not only the obstacles of you know someone's going to assault him, but also you know people would would actually lie, and you know, I have had other people who've done documentaries about different subjects, and um, you know, that's some of the things that they have to worry about too, is. Mainly that, and I'm glad you brought it up, John, is are people telling the truth? Because 
this is, you know, sometimes it, it's basically like the truth according to them, if you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. There was that old uh, saying, and in, in, uh, I forget who said it, but, it, you know, there's there's uh, there's uh, three versions of the truth. There's your version, my version, and the truth, or, or mm-hmm. what, what really happened. And, I mean, you know, and, and, you know, you took, you know, you just said, you know, you took over, what, 12, 13 years to, you know, get all this documentary footage and put it all together and, and actually make it. I mean, so you, you were in this for the long haul to make this documentary. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and I, I'm always quick to, to state just because I'm like an, an obsessively factual person. And I, I don't like, um, I don't really like mythologizing what I do at all. You know what I mean? Like, because I feel that's lying and that's phony. And I, I always think like, well, if you go with this, you're going to get trapped in a lie one day. You know, um, we weren't working every day for 13 years. Um, we were working a lot in, in 2000, a ton in 2001, a little bit in 2002. And then it sat on the shelf. And then I think, oh, five we worked for like half a year on it and sat on the shelf and like during this period there would still be times where like you know somebody would call me and go here's paul Heyman's email do you want to talk to him blah 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 blah. or here do you want to talk to so-and-so and this and that and then i think once we made the decision in late january early february of 2012 at that point it became an everyday 12 hours a day thing until not just the premiere, it, like I'd say until probably July, July of that year, every day. Cause that's cause the, the thing that, you know, there's so many things to worry about. Like you talk about documentaries, like, uh, another thing you'd stress about is, uh, releases. Well, this person had a release. Oh, this person walked in. I had one shot during the balls. I just see the same people keep coming up. It's so goofy. You see this, this film was like so super balls, Mahoney centric. Um, during my initial interview with Balls Mahoney in Virginia in 2001, um, a gentleman named Rob Van Dam, well, that's his, his wrestler name, walked in, purposely, in fact, walked into the shot to say hi to Balls and to say some stuff to the camera. And then, you know, followed that up by, like, if you want to use this, you need a release, you need to talk to my agent. Now, he had no idea that I already spoken to his agent the month before to try to get him. And at the time, he was a hot commodity. I think he ended up um, in the WWE we within you know by the summertime um and yeah his his agent wanted like two grand to sit down and talk to him he just thought it was was impossible for these people to wrap their head around the idea that anybody outside of the wrestling world would want to to talk to these people and in in the wrestling world you get paid for interviews because they're shoot interviews like now that's broken down again but especially at that time and it didn't help that i had been a wrestling fan and that was that was another pitfall too how much do i tell these people in in pre-interview stuff not only when i make the call and we confirm everything but i like to talk to my subjects because i'm i'm kind of like i'm in charge of the room like kevin would come and he would do all the tech and he would film it and then i would allow him into the co-creative process you know whatever is on my end he has feedback on whatever is on his end i have some say in it so so during the interview i would i would he would just interrupt here and there if he thought i missed something or if i, I would turn around and say do you have anything at this point and he may or may not have but in the room before you even turn the cameras on these people are picking your brain trying to see what your quote-unquote angle is because they come from a world where everybody has an angle on screen and off. So then I learned very quickly to minimize the fact that I was a fan because they view fans as the lowest common denominator. You know what I mean? Kind of the way people argue that WWE promotes to their fans. They're thinking of the, the, the dumbest yokel who doesn't understand anything and needs complete expository dialogue and very simplistic angles with no kind of like real shades of gray. That's kind of how I felt a lot of wrestlers viewed fans. And it was my job to control my perception, I felt, um, to get the interviews and to, to continue dialogues and get people to sign releases. Um, and I'm not saying lie to people, but I just mean by the time we came back to it, I was a lot older. And I knew how to like present myself. Whereas I'm, I think I did an okay job when I was like 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, but I would get very nervous and I didn't always know how to answer a lot of questions about things, you know? Um, and by that time I knew that I, I, we didn't come back to it cause I was a wrestling fan. And that, I always thought that's something that I think there was a big push in, in my interviews too, was like, 
without asking me, they, I was being presented on radio interviews and podcasts as like a super fan and they thought that helped. Because in their mind, it was awesome that a fan was doing this and this was some kind of love letter to ECW, and that's not what it was at all. Um, my, my job as a filmmaker was to document the truth, which is hard to get at. Some people would say, well, what is this? Is this just like uh, an attack piece? Or is this like, they basically want to know. <laughs> they're, the, 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 the paradigm that they kind of set up you know, was it's either A, something that's relatively promotional where they can lie, where they can just, you know, make up their own reality. Or B, I must be trying to get it all, all things negative and bury them because they're martyr. That was part of the ECW fanship was that you were, you were part of a revolution. You were part of um, something very, like, guttural and DUI, and you were a family, and anybody against you, there was a martyrdom about them. And there was, you know... It was well, so look at the term revolution and what it really means. You know what I mean? It's people um, kind of getting together almost like a, a, what do they call that? A flash mob of sorts um, and doing something about a regime. It's usually political and involves countries and wars. And it's, it's about a regime that, that you think is, is wrong. You know what I mean? There's all these ideological things that are attached to it, but basically that's what I had to penetrate. You know what I mean? So it's like at least the regular documentary, if I was documenting, I don't know, an interesting guy who, I don't know, like made billions off of popsicle sticks and then disappeared. And I had the one interview with him, at least like when I'm interviewing his family and everybody else. And then I finally do an interview with him, but they're not going to, I don't think they're necessarily going to go into it thinking that I'm a bad guy. You know what I mean? Or, or thinking that they need to feel me out. You know what I mean? And every, everybody either like was questionable of us or didn't want to do it at first and all these things. And like the funny thing was a lot of these people would be interviewed by me. And I don't know. I, I think it's almost egotistical to say that they respected me. Because I think that they did probably, but it's not like somebody said, I really respect you. And even if they did, I'd be like, well, you're a wrestler. So I don't know if that's true because you'll just say things. Maybe you want me to edit, edit it you favorably because you just thought of something you said in like the 40th minute that was, you probably shouldn't have said. But I do, but the one thing that came out of it was a lot, a lot of referrals. A lot of our, you know, jumping through to get everybody had to do with one person liking us after the interview and saying that we were fair and that we were thorough and that we were, that we presented ourselves well and wanting the project to succeed and therefore calling other people and saying, Hey, and vouching for us, essentially saying, Hey, these guys are doing this documentary. And I think we were also very lucky because when we started, we were just young enough and dumb enough to be likable and not a threat. And at the same time, professional, professional enough to get in the room with these people, you know, which is just like perfect. We lucked out you know, because if they thought we were just super fans, they'd have nothing to do with us. But if they thought we were like real journalists, well, the first thing you thought, especially when we started, the first thing you thought was, oh, well, this is going to be, is, is this real or fake? And just an attack piece about how disgusting it is, you know? Yeah, I, I and you know I, I know exactly what you're t- saying, and and you know that that is also something you know uh, that's important is you know how you matured as a filmmaker and how you choose an interviewer when you were going from you know obviously when you were interviewing them from when you were 20 to a few years later, um, but you know it, you know a lot of what you're saying there is 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 so important because when another you know some people some are trying to make a documentary, they always wonder how likely is it I'll be able to get to these people because eventually. You know, you're going to have to, you know, talk. I mean, if you want to do a, a, a documentary on the Beach Boys, for instance, at some mm-hmm. point you're going to have to sit down with them and talk about them. Otherwise, it's just sort of this piece that sort of is about them. Not, not you know what I mean, not with them, but about them. Um, which right. I, I don't know. And then, that, do they want do they want a piece of the action financially? Do they want creative control? There's all these things. Yeah, I mean, we talked about that even after. After Barbara City is like, oh, well, what's your next project? And we took a little time to decompress and run the business aspect of it. 
And then you'd come up with ideas, and then you'd right away, you'd stop. I always think in terms of, like, logistics as a filmmaker, because one of the other big things, licensing. Not just getting people to sign releases, but licensing. So somebody would say something, an idea, or Kevin and I would be in the studio kicking around ideas, and I, I don't know, maybe he'd say something, trying to think of... Uh, maybe uh, he never said this, but I'm making this up. Um, he'd say, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, that comic book writer that was really hot uh, a decade ago, Bendis. I forget, I forget his full name, but I'm just going to use him. So right away, well, if you're going to do a documentary about Bendis and you know, uh, under the, the the premise like, oh, he changed the way comic books are written. Okay, well, first we have to prove if that's true or not. That's not really my genre. It's just kind of something that peripherally was, you know, I had friends that would tell me about him. But right away, it's like, okay, well, where did, where did he raise, to, where did he grow to be? Well, he writes like half of Mar- Marvel's marquee books. Okay, well, now that's a problem because you can't do a good Bendis uh, documentary unless you get Marvel on board because you're going to need to show the stuff he drew. Or, or, or he, that he wrote, right? And that's in that's a Marvel thing. Well, who owns Marvel? Oh, Disney. Okay, now you're dealing with Disney. How do you deal with Disney? You know what I mean? <laughs> like those are the kind of things we'd have to talk about and think about. And logistics. Oh, well, where does he live? Okay, well, who are the main players you'd also want to interview? Well, you do two months of research and you come back and you go like this, these ten people. Well, where do they live? California, uh, Florida, uh, Arizona. Well. Okay, now your costs just went up obscenely because you've got to get them to say yes, and you have to have a few days off. In all these things, you need dominoes to fall. That was a big thing. A huge thing for us very early on was getting Todd Gordon. I remember I would bug him on the phone all the time, and when I lived in Philly, I went to the University of the Arts with Kev, and uh, his jewelry shop was maybe a mile away, and I would walk there like once a week and bug him. It's like this 19-year-old kid. And uh, he'd say, well, who do you have? And I remember saying to him, like, the three interviews we had at the time, like, my marquee guy was, like, John Bailey, the straw hat guy, who, for those of you who don't know, was a guy who sat in the front row of every ECW arena show from the beginning. Um, and he was just part of, he was emblematic of the fans, you know. And um, he, he said to me, John, you seem like a really nice kid, and I respect it. Like, you just you don't want to give up, but... You know, my time is really precious, and I've only ever done one other interview since I left UCW. Um, and Todd, by the way, in case I buried the lead on this, is the founder and the original owner of, of UCW. And he basically said to me, like, I don't know that I have time to do an, doc, uh, an interview where the only other guy participating is, like, uh, the straw hat guy. <laughs> And I, and thankfully, I, I said, okay, and I didn't know what to say to that, and I called him back, and I pledged to him, uh, I pleaded with him, rather, and I said, Todd, you know, I, I get where you're coming from. I totally do. Um, you're, you're that person, though. When other people ask who you have, I'm going to say Todd Gordon, and then we go from there. I was like, just give me a chance, and we didn't have all of our stuff together necessarily. Like it was just so wide at that time. So my questions were like five pages instead of like a one sheet. And he sat through two and a half hours of us, you know, doing this stupid interview and he made calls for us to his credit. You know, that's the kind of stuff though. That's the stuff you worry about getting these people dominoes falling, dealing with Disney. You know, uh, for us, a lot of it was, did, did, you know, did Paul talk to you? Did Paul Heyman talk to you? Well, no. Well, I don't know if I want to talk to you, Paul. Didn't. And those, a lot of those people came back and apologized to me once we did it and said, I'm sorry, you know, I was worried about, you know, my, where I was going to go after ECW and, you know, I didn't want to offend Paul and this and that in case, you know, jobs because he was tied in with WWE, which is the biggest, you know, pro wrestling company in the world, kind of monolithic now. And, um, and some of them even ended up doing interviews with us after the fact. Yeah, you, have you ever seen um, Escape from Tomorrowland? I never finished it. Um, yeah, that's the gorilla, the one you know, very stylistic uh, gorilla filmmaking in Disneyland. Yes. Or Disney is was, was it Disneyland or Disney World? It was one of them. Yeah, they went in and they. Yeah, that's fascinating. That whole story. Yeah, I um I actually saw that one day on a whim, and um I was just blown away by a, for a couple of reasons. First off, I got it. You know, it was kind of David Lynchian. Um, I understand yeah, yeah. what that was going for. Um, the other part of it was I had to look up. T- 
to see what did Disney think of this. Uh, and there's a fascinating story behind it. Um, but I, you know what? I will link to that in the show notes, though, everybody. Um, but there's just a lot of moving parts, and Disney did find out about it. And um, but you know, I, I don't want to take I, I don't want to take away from your story, John. Well, it's quite nice of you. <laughs> that bouncing no, I, I don't want to start talking about you know Escape from Tomorrow. Um, but you know, one thing I wanted to ask you about, you know, um, you ran a, a successful Kickstarter for this. Um, yeah, fun, yeah. Barbara, so, so you know, what what sort of tips could you sort of give that you uh, that you could give to any any people out there who are thinking about making a documentary and putting it up for crowdfunding? I have a big caveat to that. To this, I may have I might have more. But off the top of my head, my biggest one is I ran the campaign from mid-August to mid-September of 2012. So basically, we're coming up on the anniversary, the three-year anniversary of running that campaign. I don't know what the perception uh, and or as fat, if you want to call it, of Kickstarter uh, is now. I know there was a lot of pushback from some people, the idea that you're giving away free money to people. And I know that some people on Kickstarter have famously burned people. Um, the one that the one that I saw that always sticks with me, and this was thankfully well after we had made the film or a year after, there was a guy who I guess he was writing like trade paperback novels. I think that was it. Um, anyway, something printed. And he collected all the money. He he actually made them, but he was doing everything by himself. And he was a bit of a temperamental art, artsy type. And this is the problem: is like you're dealing both the beauty and the horror of it is you're dealing with artists most of the time. Now, some of the stuff is just pure commercialism, sure, um, on a low level. But like, I mean, when you're dealing with us, I'm not. A, I know that this is another uh, kind of like intellectual. Uh, this is another dirty word, artist. Um, I never wanted to be an artist when I was younger. I I wanted to be in the entertainment business. You know, that's how I look at it. And what's funny is most people, when they're teenagers, they want to be artsy and then they kind of quote unquote sell out and um, they just want to be, they understand how business works and they're willing to make um, concessions to be in the industry of their choice. Um, And they know the reality of that. And it happened in the opposite way for me because I wanted to be, and entertain. It was funny, like, I, you know, I would joke with Kev when we got older, like, the, I was more vocal about it, but I, but he went along with it, and I think he, I think he admitted to me at one point he did feel this way, too. When we were, like, you know, 16 through, like, 24, we wanted to be, not literally rock stars, like, musicians, we wanted to be rock stars who make films. We wanted to be media presences, you know what I mean? That was part of it. Now, we didn't want to just make crap, sure, but we wanted to be personalities, first and foremost, I think. And what changed in both of us, especially me, more me than him, was that I really became more of an artist. And I think people are embarrassed to say things like that because they think it sounds pretentious. There's this whole cliche around it. And a lot of times I think people are afraid of it because when you call yourself that, like, I, I think they think it infers like that you're successful, that your art is valid and that your art is um, something really deep. You know, it's really, it's, it's something that a normal person might not understand. Kind of thing. And that's just not true. That's not fair. Um, you don't have to have com- commercial successes to be artsy or think like an artist, so to speak. And that's something I I slowly came to grips with. That's just kind of how I am. You know, they tend to be, uh, I'm not a money person. Jeez, I've I've given, we have, nobody shoots herself in the foot or drops things on principle more than Kevin Yannon and I. And we have real far less money to show for it. And in some cases it was, when it came down to it, it was about like, I don't want to do something and look back in five years and, and be like, well, I did that for money, you know, cause that's, what is that? That's a prostitute. You know what I mean? <laughs> There's one thing in life that I don't like, look, we all have to work day jobs a lot of the time. Most of us do. Um, that's when I have to be a prostitute. You know, I don't want to do it with something that I feel passionate about. <laughs> so, you know, that's, yeah, I'm sorry. I'll get off on a, on a whole thing. So my, my point is that artists, <laughs> I, and thank you for sitting through this, by the way. <laughs> no, no. Um, I, 
I really do enjoy do, doing these things and just talking to people. You know what I mean? Like, I, I hope I don't come off as somebody who's in love with their own voice because I just, I love the back and forth and the sharing and, and all the stuff and talking about these experiences. Um, yeah, you had asked about Kickstarter. You're dealing with temperamental artists a lot of the time, and that can be troubling. And the biggest thing, I always think of this guy who collected all this money, he was doing everything by himself. <laughs> And um, he got sick of, and I've experienced this too. Look, whenever you do, like, I think that the final tally for us was like 440 some people gave us money. Maybe it was 480 some. It was just below 500. There's 500 separate entities giving you money. You know, most of the time it's person to person. And they believe in you enough that they gave you money or at least your product is interesting to them. But the percentage of them are just going to be crazy people. It just is, and I don't literally mean crazy people like, you know, they would be in a mental institution. I mean, that they don't, that they're just not the type that have a lot of social graces and they're dealing with you through a computer anyway, you know? So they can say whatever. So I guess this guy was, I've dealt with it too, but I guess this guy could not deal with people going, where is this? I paid for this. I'm going to sue you or some, some such nonsense. You know, and some people were probably, you know, I think the pressure probably got to the guy. Just, I'm sure some people were just like, hey, man, I gave you money six months ago. Where's the books, you know? And he, so he puts up a video on Kickstarter of himself yelling, basically, at the people who paid for this. And burn, and then shows video of him burning the first uh, like three hundred or something crazy. He threw them all in a fire. He threw the first run of it in a fire pit and started burning them. And then threatened like a hostage situation, threatened to keep burning the rest if he got any other messages and said you'll get them when you get them, basically. And stuff like that gave, like, you know, artists on their, like, bad press. I don't know that the Golden Goose has kind of been killed. I know that in wrestling, I remember I remember being interviewed, actually, by Mike Johnson backstage at a show about three and a half months before the premiere. And he talk, we were talking about Kickstarter. Um, and I think the video is still on YouTube. I'm, I'm much fatter. I, I won't watch it anymore. <laughs> but um, he... Uh, he asked me about Kickstarter, and I said I worried that, that people were going to kill the Golden Goose. And the, the question was specific to wrestling documentaries because there was a whole uh, rash of them at the time. Um, and, and I worried about it, too. Even people would come up to me and ask me for advice, and they'd tell me their idea. And I'm just thinking, like, you know, I don't know that I'm necessarily even a filmmaker to this day, you know, in, in, a, in a true sense. Um but I have some know-how and certainly Kevin Kiernan does too. And we accomplished a goal and we had something behind it that, that was more than ain't this cool. Um, and I was talking to people who seem like really nice kids who I could just tell I'm like, this is going to be a disaster and this is going to hurt anything going forward for wrestling documentaries. And I don't know that that completely bore out, but I do think that the fad kind of died down somewhat. Um, I, I think the biggest thing is to personalize it, uh, to get people that you, you're not selling your film necessarily or whatever your artistic endeavor is. You're, you're selling that in tandem with yourself. And hopefully you find something like I was smart enough to know that I had to appeal to the wrestling, uh, internet wrestling and newsletter reading population. It was the only way that I was going to get enough money to properly fund this, you know, all the licensing and all the other costs. Um, budgeting is really important, you know, Oh, I'm, sorry. I'm jumping around here. I punch at the again. Basically, when you do these interviews, you have to talk about your real story and why you care about this thing and why it's relevant. And you have to convince people. And another thing is that this is a, what, what we realized through doing this is we should have been pitching a pre-order system. There's this idea that you're getting free money to do something. Actually, we screwed up our budget because the person who did our budget, who you know, isn't myself or Kevin, and I don't want to even say the person's name because. <laughs> we have no relation to them anymore. Um, but he was another person who was helping to produce this. Um, and it's kind of a deal with the devil thing after a while. And I knew that deep down, but I didn't want to fully deal with it, you know, because I, I, I needed this to get done. I, I, need, I, I didn't want to die knowing like every few years people would say, Hey man, whatever happened to that documentary? Or shit? Yeah, I never did it. You know, I never completed it. I couldn't, I couldn't bear it. So I had the opportunity and I had to be talked into it. But once I did, once you go down that road, you know, you're, you're either all in or you're not. And unfortunately we didn't have a proper budget because 
not only is it a pre-order system, like it's basically like, hey, you give me money to complete the film and you'll get the film, but it's also you have to give so many gifts that like, I think honestly, we probably spent like a third of the budget on, I mean, that, that's not a completely factual figure, but it, a good percentage of the budget went to all the gifts we had to give people. Because first of all, even the film, even if you pledge just to get the film, I had to print the film myself. You know what I mean? Like I had to send it to disc makers and get it professionally done. There's a cover, there's cover art. I had to pay for that, you know, mass production, um, mailing it out myself, you know, um, so then you got to deal with like stamps.com or the, or the post office every day. Um, posters, posters cost money. Um, well, one of the, one of the, the things that made this possible was, it's, and it's funny, I, you know, I haven't spoken publicly about this because I just haven't done this. The gentleman who co-hosts Ric Flair's podcast, Conrad Thompson, he's really the person who made this possible at the end of the day, because I was, we were down, we, we had used up 20 of our like 30 days on Kickstarter and we still had, it was going to come down to the wire. If you did the math on it, it was like, if we incrementally average this much every day, which we have been, we may or may not have this still at the, the 11th hour. And a gentleman named Conrad Thompson uh, saw it on, I believe Del- Dave Meltzer's website who is the, uh, the author and editor of uh, Wrestling Observer newsletter and website. And he gave us, I think, four grand, I think. It was a good amount of money. But here's the thing. Because that, that, that at that level, I then had to go get a wrestler and fly to him and give him a private screening the week before. And that's costly, you know. Who, what what, what rest did you get? Um, for some reason, he really wanted Shane Douglas. Oh, cool. Uh, who's Troy Martin? Um, and it was really, I gotta be honest with you, it's really neat. We flew down there. He has Conrad has a beautiful home. And uh, real quick to, to wrap that up, once Conrad did this, it became obvious to everybody they're gonna make it. And that's the funny thing. People, you, you realize in hindsight, people weren't giving you money, not because they didn't care about the film, but because they weren't, they were, a lot of people still to this day think that you donate money and then you never get it back, which isn't true. I never, and I also never had, the other mis, uh, misnomer is that I handle your money. And I don't know if it's exactly the same, but at that time, Amazon Payments, which was a uh, subsidiary of Amazon, uh, Tom. They did all the financial work for Kickstarter, and they t- that's the other thing. They take a percentage. Kickstarter takes a percentage. Amazon takes a percentage. So off the top, ten percent gone, roughly. Mm-hmm. And you get you don't get the money until you don't see any money in your bank account until like three weeks after this thing closes if it's successful. But because it was successful, um, because Conrad did that rather, it exploded and we actually got more money than we had asked for. And thank God we did because every penny got spent, man. Because nobody did a budget on what it would cost. What, what it would cost to get Shane Douglas on board for that. I mean, we were friendly with him, but he wasn't going to take a, a weekend away from his family, his boys. Uh, to to go to this place without, you know, being flown there, being, you know, be, being put up at least in a hotel, you know? Um, and then we had to fly there because I had to be there too, you know? Um, and it was a great experience, you know? Shane actually spent the entire afternoon answering every question that Conrad, Conrad, yeah, Conrad and his family had. Um, probably the greatest shoot interview ever in that you're, it's an interactive shoot interview with a real human being who's not, who's not being filmed and therefore not playing up things. And, uh, and then we all watched the movie together with Shane and myself commenting to Conrad, almost like a live director's cut before the film even used to people. So it was a really great experience, but it was a costly experience. I had to rent the arena, which is a story within itself. That arena, we weren't going to get that arena until two, two months and a half before the premiere. It was announced the day we signed the deal. We did not think we were getting that building for the longest time. And um, we were worried about where in Philly there was going to be a premiere, actually. Well, I'm sorry, where in Philly there's going to be a career? 
<laughs> no, a premiere. Oh, a premiere. I was where, just... where we where we were going to debut our film, you know. So I guess um, be yourself, show your passion, answer every question. Have an answer for everything. Hopefully, you pick a topic that has a fan base where there is media to promote to those people. Um, because imagine if I picked, imagine if I did the best documentary ever on checkers which sounds silly but i've seen some documentaries honestly where i didn't know anything about the subject but i took a chance um and i said this is amazing and it doesn't matter if you're a fan of this or not and that's kind of my pitch for my own film by wire city i mean it's not really about wrestling it's about it's, it's about culture it's about the culture. It's, it's a journey of people. Uh, and in this case, they don't, at the end of it, you know, Rocky doesn't win, you know, they don't win. That's the crazy thing about it. And like, where are they now? And how has this affected their lives? You know? So yeah, I would so all the things I just said, plus budget correctly and realize that you are going to have to pay, realize 10% is coming off the top right away and realize that you're going to have to pay for all these benefits that you're giving the people so that they, they will give you money. That's the crazy thing. You're every time somebody pledges, you're close to your goal and yet sort of further away if you don't budget properly because they're, they, they pledge and I've never done the math on it because I'm afraid to, and now it's over and I don't have to, but there were certain pledges where I'm sure that at the end of the day, it was kind of like, well, we're giving all that money back. <laughs> I mean, I don't actually even remember how much it cost to, to, to fly down to see Conrad and, and to bring Shane and all that stuff. We probably gave so much money back to Conrad at the end of the day. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I mean, one of the things I've, I've, you know, learned about in crowdfunding campaigns um, from doing them too, is the perks. Is you know, the perks can get you. And we've had you know other filmmakers on here like Don Fields who spoke a lot about that, and crowdfunding gurus like Eli Rigolato, um, who would always talk about that too. So I mean, that that's good, you know, now John, because if you do another one at some point, you know, you have that knowledge to build that into the price points, so you can break that mm-hmm. breakdown list. So you know, if if it's a hundred dollar perk, okay, well we're getting sixty dollars back. That's sixty percent of the perk and $40 goes to the entire cost of making it and you know stuff like you know and and I think that is invaluable because I mean everyone makes mistakes with their first crowdfunding campaign Um, you know I, I certainly did and I know other people have as well um but you know, and that that is an amazing perk, by the way, is having somebody actually fly down to watch the documentary. Because um, that's something you know, if I had the extra money, that would, that would be a perk that I would have looked at as well. Because um, that that sounds you know absolutely phenomenal, especially being able to get the wrestler. Um, I don't know if I would have picked Shane Douglas though. Um, I may have actually picked for the hell of it the Blue Mini because uh, I think he'd be a. Fun I was guy. pushing that because it would have been so much easier, and he was a personal friend of mine. I pushed Mini because well, the one thing I was scared to death of like, what if they pick like New Jack, you know? <laughs> Then I have to fly new check down there and like maybe have to share a hotel room with him because of the cost. I don't know, you know. Um, and I will, and I like Jerome Young, but I, I also like who knows what's gonna happen. You know what I mean? It's kind of like having that crazy friend you take to a bar in your early to mid twenties, and you're just like, oh, Jimmy's Jimmy's a great guy. He's a little like uh, he plays it fast and loose sometimes, but all you know, you know. Every third time Jimmy's starting a fight, he walks up to your waist and he's like, hey, man, that group of guys is giving me a dirty look. I'm going to jump one of them. You got my back? You know, I, I have been in that situation with people. And then like, oh, my God, Jimmy's become a liability. Like, I don't think we could go out with Jimmy anymore. That's what I was afraid of with, with, with doing this. So I was I had a conversation where I was like, Conrad, don't you like the Blue Mini? Isn't the Blue Mini the coolest? How about Jerry Lynn? You know who's really cool and loves cats? Stevie Richards loves cats. Let's all hang out. But, uh, <laughs> he, he picked uh, Shane, and you know what? It worked out great. I had a great time, and I am forever thankful to Conrad, who is a really – fun, cool guy. You know what would be funny if he had picked someone like the Sandman? That would have been trouble. Yeah, <laughs> that would have been trouble. <laughs> I, I've actually been around the Sandman before. Um, in, in like non-wrestling uh you know, a non wrestling environment, and he yeah. is a guy who is exactly the same. Um, oh, yeah, oh, smokes yeah. a lot, smokes like a chimney. Um, is a you know, uh, and that, that this was like 2004. I met him again, uh, but actually, I heard recently that he's completely clean and sober now. That's really good because I know he a few years ago. Uh, had some trouble and lost a lot of very long-time friends who ended up kind of cutting him off. 
I mean, this is what I was told. It's hearsay, but I have it from very good sources. Um, certain people that are identifiable to him um, don't talk to him anymore, or they didn't for uh, quite a period of time. So that, that's the first time hearing that. I think that's really great. Um, I didn't have the greatest experience with him in 2001, but I will say by the end of this whole thing, um, you know, I've heard a lot of horrible things about him. I've seen him be a really trashy guy and say a lot of horrible things. But having said that, um, my lasting memory of him, so if he died tomorrow, the story that I would tell is I was at, you know, filming at one of the extreme reunion, extreme rising shows. And I went out back, um, coincidentally enough to, to smoke because I have a horrible nicotine habit. So the, uh, quit or don't start if, if you're listening to this. Cause it's, it's been very hard to, you know, going off and on with that. So I went out to the car to get away from the craziness of these shows and smoke. And there was this old guy playing like softball or like a, like a whistle ball with kids and uh, in the part in the adjacent parking lot. And I thought, well, that's weird because we're kind of in an industrial area, but it's kind of charming to me. And he just seemed, he was kind of like, Hey, you go here and you do this. And, and he's like, Oh, don't worry about it, buddy. I'll get, you'll get the next one. And I, I'm listening to the voice and I start hearing it. Like, Tyler, throw it back. Let it, let him back again. That voice. And I realized that old man is that's hack. It's Jim Fullington. <laughs> And I just found it such a great juxtaposition. And I also found it charming in the sense that, like, the real human being, the one thing that I've never heard anyone say is that he wasn't uh, good with his kids. And I, and I saw it there. You know, he came in. I think he, I think he did it for free, that show. Uh, I think he did it as a favor to one of his old ECW friends or Shane or something. And... um he brought his kids and they played with ball. He did his one run in. Everybody popped. He drinks his beer. You know, Metallica plays, and that was his night. And he just did it to see old friends and hang out. And really, he just, you know, he just spent time with his kids. And he introduced his kids to his his crazy old family from the nineties. You know, I, I it's, so that's something that I you know, I can say about him. Yeah, that, that is the positive. Well, you know, I, I have a funny story for you too. Um, he when I used to work at. Uh, what was called EB Games, which was uh, an old, which was what was GameStop before GameStop became GameStop, um, and um, EB Games. We saw, you know, and I was up in Broomall, Broomall, Pennsylvania, and uh, we're in this, you know, and it's kind of like an upscale shopping center we were in. Well, one day in 2001, in comes the Sandman, and he's got his kid with him. It was Tyler, and uh, he's talking about buying a PlayStation or a PlayStation Two at that point, and. <laughs> my manager had no clue who this guy was and I'm like oh my god it's a six I was like what maybe two, it's, it's 2001 so I, I'm thinking I'm like 16, 17 and I'm like oh my god it's a Sandman and I'm trying to you know and he's like yo what's up buddy yo you got that PS2 <laughs> oh god it hurts my voice yeah. <laughs> exactly exactly and uh, and, he, and you know I was like oh yeah sure buddy and so, um, you know, and uh, he ends up leaving. I was like, oh, my God, the save just came in here, and we sold him a PS2, and uh, my manager was like, who was that guy? So I, I ended up bringing in some uh, VHS tapes of um, of ECW, and I showed him, and he was laughing his ass off at who he was, and he wanted to bring him in into the store to have a wrestling match with our assistant manager, who was this obese guy who, who was just the biggest curmudgeon. He had these, like, he had a completely bald head. He had, like, these, like, bulbous moles. He looked like a cartoon character. He looked like a real-life Homer Simpson, if you can imagine that. Okay. So, he said to him, hey, I'm gonna, we'll bring the Sandman in, and you guys have a wrestling match here in the store. And he wouldn't, like, he kept, wouldn't tell him it was a joke. He was trying to get him to believe it was real. And I just remember, finally, the assistant manager flipped out and was like, no, I'm not gonna wrestle the Sandman in the middle of the store and it was like it just kind of hit me like, like that was one of the things I never thought I would hear in my life was somebody refusing to wrestle the salmon in the middle of a retail store um, just one of the funny memories I have of salmon and real quick because we buried the lead again for the people who are who are saints and have stuck with us um, there's a Sandman, the wrestling character, real name, uh, Jim Fullington, also goes by Hack to his friends. He was a wrestler in the early 90s who carried around a kendo stick, which is, it was popular at the time because um, Michael Fay got in trouble in uh, Singapore. He was this kid. He was this teenager 
who um, I forget what he did, but they ended up he he's guilty he, of the trial. He spray painted those cars. He, oh, okay, right, right, right. And uh, his punishment was they would whack him ten times with a, a quote unquote Singapore cane. So the same man's gimmick, which was originally that he was a surfer, very miscast gimmick. He be, he maintained being the Sandman, but he was a guy who would come out in like Zuba pants and then later jeans when that that when somebody told him that fad was over. And he would come out with that and a T-shirt, drinking a beer, smoking a cigarette, and hitting people with this cane. This does not necessarily yeah, does not necessarily sound like the wrestling you may have grown up with, or even the wrestling you see today. It really worked in that environment. He became a cult hero. A big thing with ECW, which you could never do today, was the original music. They didn't use generic music. They used hits that were identified, that you then identified with that person and then you would hear on a radio. Um, and they would be rock and, and, and metal and they'd be hip hop and rap in a time when that was just, now it's, that's, that's music now. Hip hop is just it's a part of music. Um, it is the dominant form of music and rocks share in music slips day after day. Um, but at that time it was like a very forward thinking thing to attach hip hop to some of the acts. And Heyman was a, Paul Heyman, the, the, uh, creative guy behind ECW and eventually the owner, he, uh, he gave Han- Sandman, uh, enter Sandman by Metallica, which is a pretty big, is one of the biggest hits ever. And, um, I hear that song to this day and I think of it and he would come out half of the fun of him was this five minute entrance where he, the music would build up and he'd come out and he started coming out in the audience and uh, he would drink a beer and then smash it over his head. And he'd actually cut himself and bleed from the beer again, from smashing it. And uh, he would go up to people. And I saw a million videos of this as I was going through uh, the collection for our, for the footage that we used of ECW. He'd walk up to a kid and go, are you 18? It's kind of like the worst version of a bouncer carding somebody ever. He'd walk up and go, are you 18? And the kid would go, yeah. And then he'd go, cool. And he would just dump a beer down the guy's throat from like a very high angle and it would get all over the kid's face and then he'd high five them. So this interactive experience. And that's the family. That's who we're, that's the, the, the guy who basically lives his gimmick that Dave and I just talked about. <laughs> My, um, my dad actually used to work in Wilmington and it was right up the street from Hacks Bar and Grill. And, um, that is, you know, I had friends who would, you know, cause, cause eventually wrestling shows started happening there, but they said, you know, mm. there would be, you could go in there and there would be the same man just living the gimmick, drinking stuff like that. Um, I mean, the well, guy- you see the raw footage of our, our interview, it took place in there and he didn't seem to understand that playing, uh, commercial music during our interview over the loudspeaker of the bar would hinder the process considering we couldn't license those songs. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, continue. But yes, I, I know that bar because we went there and he wanted to just do it at a, at a random table in his bar. Well, you know, when I was at the premiere uh, of, of Barbara City, I, had, I was laughing when someone actually said to you during the Q&A, they said, oh, I would just use the WWF footage and told Vince McMahon to go fuck himself. And I remember mm-hmm. your, your reply was, well, maybe you have a very good entertainment lawyer who who is a very expensive, you know, who is on, you know, is a family or, or is on the payroll. Yeah. But, you know, that would be a hell yeah. of a lot of money to pay to even sit down with them to talk about using video footage. Oh, I had people steal the movie online when I would write them and say, hey, I'm, I'm the director. Like, this is a really small thing that I, I hope, can, you know, to make money just to reinvest in us. Hey, I'm not trying to get you in trouble reporting it or anything. Like, could you just not? And they would be like, oh, man, I'm just trying to spread it. You know, uh, you know, stopping people from doing this is so un ECW or something. And I'm like, what the fuck do I care? Like, there are people who you a will use anything to justify what they do, but also b that again circling all the way back. A big problem that I had was just these wrestling wrestling fans, specifically these old ECW fans. They just don't get it. Like you said, like oh, I should just tell this giant worldwide global corporation that stock traded, f you. I'm using your footage. Like that, you would have never even been in the premiere. They would have sent a cease and desist months before that. You know, like I would, I would still be paying them today if I did that. Oh, absolutely. and for 
mean, forget about today. It's only been three years. I, I would be paying them well into my 80s. I, I, and I wouldn't have had the money, and I'd probably end up in jail or something. Yeah. Oh, you just can't do that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And which is why whenever whenever he said that, um, you could just tell that he's never had experience down this path. But um, – but you know, John, I wanted to ask you. You know, as we, you know, I've been talking to you. Um, I mean, we've been talking for about two hours now. Um, I wanted, <laughs> I, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you. You know, what, what, what's next for for John? You know, what, what are you working on next? Oh, we're we're, uh, and it pains me to say, it. we are in a holding pattern right now. We managed to make enough money to really reinvest in ourselves and. Um, <sighs> We still have a few things that we want, you know, production wise, we wanted to upgrade. Like, one of the things that, that, that you should know first of all, go to barbarcity.com if you have not seen the documentary. You can download it. There, there are no more DVDs left. I have to go bug the guy who does our website. Because I just, I don't look at these things because I made it. And I'm, you know, in a weird way, it's like it was over for me the moment the after party wrapped and then I still had to deal with it. And that's like the creator part of it. You know what I mean? Like I, I had lived it, I had accomplished it, you know? So I don't go to barbed wire city because I know it's there, you know, I, I made the movie, you know, but apparently I just saw last week, uh, randomly I, I wanted to see what the website looked like. And there's still, it just says DVDs are sold out. And I'd say like once a month, I get a, uh, an email from somebody saying like when is that going to be restocked and like it's because not everybody knows like in Febu in late january and early february we did a kind of a going out of business kind of sale to liquidate our dvd stock because when you have a normal life and like a day job that you have to do in the real world it's really difficult to then like run home and like find out what the orders are and you know, run to the post office and send these things out and just manage the business. You know, it was just, it was, it was that time. So there, there's a VOD there. There's a, uh, or I shouldn't say a VOD, but a direct download rather. At barbarcity.com that you can purchase if you want to see it. My point to bringing that up other than a shameless plug is uh, it's in standard definition. And a lot of it was shot on a handy cam in the early 2000s. <laughs> You know, obviously we wanted to upgrade a lot of stuff. Some of it we did have, but it made no sense to intersplice that into our film. Like it just would have looked like a mess to me. And um, so obviously everything has to be HD and that we wanted better sound. We wanted better lighting. We wanted, uh, you know, we wanted a lot of different things. And um, once we got near that, we started talking about different projects and we finally settled on one. And it was going to be about gentrification, essentially. It was going to be a, a, a urban renewal, which is like the, the uh, promotional press release version. Because um, we're going through that in, in the city I grew up in, which is Allentown, and the whole Lehigh Valley in uh, eastern Pennsylvania. And um, we wanted to really study it. Did it. Does it work? Does it not work? I mean, there's a lot of things involving money. I had worked down there during, during you know, it's still going on. It's like a 30-year project. And they built an arena. I mean, the arena was supposed to draw all these businesses in and then draw all the, the people who were in an economic state to spend money down there and stimulate the economy. And all of a sudden, you know, the dilapidated downtown area that people are afraid to go into um, will become this beautiful, you know, almost tourist attraction that the locals spend money in as well. Um, and I just said, this is just such a good story and we don't have to travel. When we looked at all the boxes from what we learned from making a documentary, we said, this is awesome. It's in our backyard. We know some of the players. We know the people to talk to. We know the journalists. You know, in some cases, we knew them first person. Um, and I spent a week researching and I had a long like, three-hour conversation on the phone with Kev and we had another one in person. <laughs> And then, um, and we even shot some test footage. We, we went down for the second event at the arena to interview people about if they were excited about the arena, what they thought, um, why this was good for the city. And um, I just figured some, there's got to be some weird financial thing going on here. It's like there's this special zone called the Neighborhood Improvement Zone, and the state just gives that money back to the, to the people who are developing the lands. And I was just like, this is their guarantee their money back and we're talking millions of dollars and just from working down there for a few months I was like there's something about this it's who's oh, who's watching this where's the oversight you know and um, <laughs> Kevin said like look you know he was he moved he, Kevin right now is in Alaska 
Um, he's in Alaska for six months. He left mid June. Uh, we had, we both had to go to a wedding of a mutual friend. And then two days later, I, I helped pack him up and drove him down to the Philadelphia international airport to fly out. So he wanted to put the whole thing on hold. He just said, there's no point in starting this and then me leaving and this all being on your back, especially because he's far more tech savvy, uh, with the filmmaking. I'm the dreamer who, who puts the story together. I'm a very capable editor but I'm nowhere near Kev, you know? Um, and he was just like, it's going to be a mess. You have to get a replacement person and you're kind of running tech and running the creative vision when you interview people or shoot footage. And so we kind of put it on hold and, and maybe even like won't do it kind of a thing. And then like two weeks ago, maybe three, a uh, big headline article in the local paper, the FBI like raided the mayor, the downtown mayor's office and a bunch of other offices. And, uh, and I guess in Reading this happened too, or Lancaster, I forget. And um, now a lot of people, including the main uh, um, developer, who is making a crazy amount of money off of this, are under investigation apparently by the FBI. <laughs> I just, I, um, from afar, I emailed him the article and I just wrote like, of course this would happen. You know, like, we would have been, um, when did we shoot test footage? September. And I did all my research. So we would have been pretty sick into this by now. We would have almost been a year in and we would have had the contacts and had everything. And, um, we would be on the ground kind of uh, shooting as it happens kind of a thing. And uh, which is something that Kevin, he does not like sit down interview, tell the past kind of stuff, actually. Um, his favorite parts are the more active parts at the reunion in our documentary. We used uh, a reunion of these guys, as I mentioned before, kind of as tent poles that we kept coming back to, bouncing between the, the present and the past. That's his favorite stuff. So he would have been in love with all of this. And now it's all, you know, something is going on in that story that we kind of felt might be an angle of it and we're not covering it. So <laughs> the, the, that's a, a long way of saying like, Hey, would you have liked to have seen this documentary? Yeah. Well, uh, we would have too, but uh, right now we're in a whole thing. <laughs> I did manage to make a wonderful five minute video for my nephew though. So for all of you concerned, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you always got to be creating uh John. That's what yeah, I found out. Just, it was an outlet and it was a great way to, uh, we did it not only to make, you know, make my, my nephew feel important, but also it was a great way to test out a lot of new stuff we had in mess with because it's something where you don't have to be perfect. You know, a little kid doesn't care if, if something's washed out or if the lights don't work or the mic, the new mic doesn't work right or you're messing with the settings of your new, you know, HD camera or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> So. Very true. Uh, you know, and, um, you know, John, I want to say, you know, thanks again for coming on the show. I know, I, you know, we've been chatting um, about ECW and a lot of things that, you know, like I, I'm definitely going to have the show notes filled, by the way, everyone. So if there's anything John and I talked about that you're kind of like, what the hell was that? Trust me, I'm going to put a ton of stuff on the show notes because I have a lot of notes in front of me right now. Um, John, where can people find you out online? Oh, I'm kind of hiding from social media. I mean, if you Google my name, you'll find me. <laughs> um, I don't do a lot with Facebook. Uh, I've been just, I, I've gotten back into Twitter only. It was a promotional thing that I, I really, listen, you, if you're still listening to this, you know, I can talk, you know, <laughs> I may, I may not be able to do 142 characters. So the Twitter thing is a little bit of a mess, but you can find me on Twitter. Um, I don't even, I honestly don't know my handle, but if you, I, there's only two John Philip Pavages in the world and one of them's my dad and he doesn't know how to work with stuff. So, J <laughs> so you'll, you'll, you'll You'll find me. John's Twitter handle is at BWC film. <laughs> uh, that, yeah, do you know how I can change that, by the way? I don't really know how to change it. Yeah, you can change that. Okay, good. Because like that was something that was literally just created for the film. And now I, I just, life goes on. Like, I don't, I, I appreciate you having me on and it's fun to talk about this stuff. But, um, like I, I do have friends who do podcasts that they have me on for different reasons. And they're always like, oh, you come on and you can promote Bar Wars City. And I'm like, 
can I just not be the barbed wire TV guy? You know, for once, can I just have an opinion that's just valid because I'm me and maybe I can present myself well? Well, that's, so, that's why I had you on. I want you. I, I mean, it, it was more of how to create a documentary in general, mm-hmm. you know, crowdfunding and stuff like that. Now, granted, we. Oh yeah, I wasn't throwing shade at you, but uh, <laughs> but I do. I do need to change that. So I'll have to talk to you. Uh, I'll have to message you. I'm like 45 minutes late to to meet a friend who flew in from California. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, hey, John, I, I want to say thank you. And please apologize to your friend for me. Everyone, you can find me at DaveBullis.com. Twitter, it's at Dave underscore Bullis. Ladies and gentlemen, John Filipovich, documentary filmmaker. John, it was a pleasure and honor, sir. And uh, I can't wait to see what you do in the future. Thank you so much, Dan. I had so much fun doing this, man. Oh, yeah. Same here, buddy. And uh, I will talk to you very soon. Let's catch up. Let's not make it another, like, three years before we talk to each other again. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. <laughs> All right. Uh, take care, John. You too, man. Bye-bye. Find Dave at DaveBullis.com Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.